Hi everyone. This week you might have noticed your favorite apps, Outlook, Strava, Steam, Slack, being out for some time. This was caused by an AWS outage. Today we'll have a look at what happened, how did it affect us as data minded, and what can you do to prevent all of this. And with me to explain all that is Stein de Haas, our technical lead at Conveyor. Welcome, Stein. Hello. How are you doing? Better than Monday. Yeah, busy week. Well, it's it's okay. We had most we had mostly under control. Today we'll discuss three major questions like what happened at AWS, how did it hit us, and what can people do to prevent such an outage or to at least mitigate it. So what happened at AWS is they messed something up as we engineers uh, we push things through production, right? And sometimes you make a mistake. So they made a small mistake with a DNS configuration of I think mostly DynamoDB endpoints. And apparently almost all of AWS has some connection with uh, DynamoDB. You couldn't launch virtual machines in the North Virginia region. You couldn't do anything with IAM globally. Um, you couldn't update your IAM roles, etc. cetera. So um, a lot of people experienced some hardship this Monday. Yeah. And how did it affect us? Mostly we noticed it um, through our alerting system. We couldn't pull any new images on our Azure cluster. Um, and then we also, some of our customers contacted us. We can't do uh, conveyor builds, so they couldn't deploy new packages on conveyor. Yeah. Uh, everything on AWS was actually running smoothly uh, for us, but it's just they couldn't deploy new projects at, uh, yeah. at that point. Yeah. You mentioned already IAM failing in, um, in Virginia. What actually happened there? So IAM is identity and access management. So it identifies um, virtual machines as having access to certain actions, right? So it gives you the power to interact with, I don't know, SQS and SQS messages to interact with S3. Um, so your virtual machines or your ECS containers or your EKS containers they need rights to do certain things in the AWS client. So IAM is responsible for that. It's, it has two parts. It has the configuration part where you configure which um, role can do which actions. So that's the configuring your IAM roles and policies. And it has a second part when your service is running, it fetches credentials so you can authenticate to do those actions with S3. Um, so the global IAM configuration was completely down because that's hosted in the North Virginia region in AWS. However, getting credentials and doing actions, there are regional endpoints for that. However, you have to either use an SDK that has a had a major version, I think around July 2022 or 2023. From that point on, every SDK who had a new major version then used those regional endpoints by default, but all other older SDK still use the old North Virginia uh, yep. endpoint. So you have to configure them to just use the regional endpoints. And that way you can't do updates to your IAM roles, but your services can still uh, use other AWS services, right? So essentially IAM is hosted in Virginia and this is for the configuration of your roles. So let's say I have mm -hmm. a data job, it gets a specific role which it can uh, use to contact other services. Mm -hmm. And that configuration is part of IAM. My yes. data job has the rights to this path on S3 or this bucket on yes. S3. Correct. And the second thing you explained, whenever I do those actions and my role mm -hmm. needs to get some tokens or credentials, this is fetched in a different way. This is not depending on this Virginia. Correct. So from North Virginia, this configuration is synced to all AWS data centers uh, okay. across the world. This, so this is a uh, globally synced. So updates that you were doing couldn't you couldn't do updates, but even if you could, they couldn't be synced to the regional locations. But they still have the latest update and rights that you have. Um, okay, and this is why it was still functioning. But then, if you mm -hmm, would change correct. your rights in IAM, that would not be uh, no. propagated or not happen even. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay, I see. And the reason for this scale 
is, as I understand, many of AWS services, of course, rely on access management, like all of them. And so you could not change any rights anymore. Mm -hmm. So it kept on working, but no changes anymore to your rights to use these services. So this, yeah, the annoying part about that one is that it is very hard to roll out updates or roll out new versions of your application um, to fix then the issues that were going on. So that, for example, we use Terraform. When you do a yep. Terraform apply, well, it will try to see if the role needs to be updated. So we'll try to check the current okay. configuration of the role. That wouldn't work. Um, so depending on your configuration management tool, you weren't able to roll out a new release even of your application. Yeah. I but see. your application could keep on running. So at Data Mine It, our product conveyor allows you to run data workloads and schedule data workloads. Mm -hmm. How did this affect our product? So there was an outage. I don't remember when exactly, but uh, years ago with regards to IAM in globally. Um, so at that point, we picked up the best practices of always setting the SDKs to talk to the regional endpoints. Yeah. Luckily, this can be done with an environment variable. Uh, and as you know, uh, Conveyor is a scheduler and runner for data applications uh, using containers. Since it can be set with an environment variable, we configure that environment variable for all the jobs that our customers run. So all our customers automatically have this configuration set correctly. So that means that most of, almost all of the running jobs of our customers could properly run without issues. Yep. Um, luckily, we also made um, a conscious decision a couple of years ago to copy our uh, container images to our uh, regional registry. So for our AWS customers, um, they were also pulling containers from a local ECR registry and not from ECR public. So they didn't notice any issue there as well. Apparently during a migration, we forgot one minor service. So there was a bit of a hindrance there for our, for our users. Um, but mostly things were running fine. Yeah. So things that could have gone, things that could have gone wrong were like, um, we launch a data job, which is a Docker container, essentially mm -hmm. that container needs to be pulled to your cluster. And if mm -hmm. you would then have a dependency on let's say public ECR, which is hosted in Virginia then you would not be able to fetch it. So if I understand correctly, the only fix that you needed to do was like an outdated container image that you were still referring to in public ECR. That was for our AWS customers. So for our Azure customers, we sadly didn't, there was one, we had a similar issue, a component, the networking component was pulling, not from public ECR, that wouldn't make sense, but from K.io, which is the Red Hat container registry, I believe. Yeah. Um, and they also had an outage because it's hosted on AWS. Yeah. Okay. So we, on Azure, we're going to do the exact same thing that we already did on, on AWS. We're going to ensure that we have every image replicated in the same region as our clusters are running so that we don't depend on a, on an external service going down. Yeah. Okay. Let's maybe then talk a bit about what people can do to avoid this or to at least mitigate or mitigate the risk to be affected by an AWS outage. So what are the things you would recommend people do or take action on? So the first one is for this US East one outage, it's very clear that IAM is a global service, um, but you can mitigate the issue with using those regional endpoints. Um, and that's rather easy. Secondly, remove that dependency on public ECR. If you're running on AWS, configure your EKS add-ons to use a local copy of public ECR. There are multiple ways to achieve this. You can manually copy them or you can ECR pull through caching. Um, it's a service that AWS offers. That, does that mean that when you pull in an image that it creates a copy? Yeah, it creates a copy on the fly. And the third thing is, you also don't want to depend on external container registries too much. So again, you can think of this in two phases for the running or the building uh, for running for sure. Don't depend on external registries. We all know the, 
the thing that Docker Hub did a couple of years ago, introduced rate limiting. And I know yep. why they did it, right? It was costing them, it was a free service. It was costing them way too much. It makes sense. So yep. you want to duplicate those as well to ensure that when they, they have an issue, your clusters don't have an issue. The biggest work is mostly in, if you're using the pull through cache, you still need to update where you're pulling your image from. And if you're manually copying them, you also need to update where you're pulling your image from. That is actually the, the most work in our experience. For every Helm chart you install in your Kubernetes cluster, you need to update those images. So that's the, that's the most work actually. Okay. And you had a fourth mitigation, I believe, right? Fourth one is prepare. It's basically prepare for outages. Outages will happen. As somebody, yeah. everybody can make a mistake. Um, so you need to prepare and you need to ensure what we like to do is we have um, a disaster recovery playbook. So basically it highlights the steps that we, we want to do as a company when a disaster strikes. For us, it's, um, it's a three-step approach. So basically the first one is the notification and activation phase. Basically we notify the correct people that an incident is going on. Yep. That means both internally and externally. And then we're investigating how bad is the issue? What is the impact? Do we need to go to our second phase, which is recover to another region in our case? And the third phase is everything is open, over now. Uh, it's called the reconstitution phase, but basically the simple thing is if you recover to another region, we need to go back to our primary region because that's where we want to host everything. And also we write a post-mortem, so we prepare for the future. And how do you then test all of this? I mean, you can, you can devise a, a playbook on mm -hmm. disaster recovery, but how do you really prepare? So that is... Another very important part of what we do is we test this every couple of months, minimal once a year, uh, using a tabletop exercise. Um, do you know D&D? &D? Dungeons and Dragons? Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. You basically yes. all sit together on a table and you imagine that you're playing in this fantasy world. Well, this is a lot more boring. We fantasy that we're playing in an issue that is going on. Oh, yeah, so yeah. we also have some kind of a dungeon master like role, or we call it the, the tabletop facilitator, which prepared uh, a session and said like, Hey, this is the outage I prepared that is going to happen. Um, and we're going to role play that. The idea is that they get the reflex of taking that run book, following it, making a checklist, and it becomes a habit. It becomes yeah. easier. Secondly, it also helps with mentally preparing for when an issue is happening, getting in that mindset of, well, we need to first ensure things are mitigated a bit. Do we need to go to that reconstitution phase? That's, that's like a fire exercise that you do and you take some learnings. And in this case, you do it to prevent or, or to know how you would respond to an outage and mm -hmm. follow the whole procedure, right? So I'll, I'll try to summarize. What you recommend is indeed a regional endpoints to have less dependencies mm -hmm. on that global service. Then also the container registry that you want to pull locally. Thirdly, mm -hmm. removing your dependencies on external dependencies like Docker Hub and these kinds of services that mm -hmm. also rely indirectly on AWS. And then finally, the big thing, prepare for these things and do the tabletop exercise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If we zoom out, we, we learned that there were many services or many products being out because more than 140 services of AWS were affected by the IAM outage. Then at Data Minded, we already took some mitigation steps before because we learned from the past that these mm -hmm. things can go out. And then you mentioned four recommendations on how to mitigate that. And I believe you wrote all of them down in a blog post for people who are interested in more information. So I'll add them to the comments. And then the only thing remaining, I think, is to thank you, Stein, for giving us a look into how you dealt with the AWS outage and to share your insights. So thanks a lot. Thank you too, Johnny, for being a great host. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Check out our other videos that we have published in our channel, and we'll see you next time.
Bye, bye. Bye.